I started a manga recently called Usuzumi no Hate. An android girl wanders a post-apocalyptic earth that has been dormant for over 50 years. Humanity has all died out to an alien pathogen that preserves your body in crystals. Your cadaver will not decompose. If you would have been a human that caught this condition 50 years ago, you'd have a few hours before it finally took you, and one of the things that makes this manga interesting is that because their bodies are preserved, you see how people chose to spend their final hours. One chapter, we find a man painting a portrait of his lover. In another, the girl sees where people have fought off one of the aliens, seemingly in an attempt to protect something. A few pages later, we see what that something was. In one chapter, the girl finds her way into a cinema, and curiously, one of the projectors next to a corpse is still running. Almost like a TV that was never turned off after the one watching it fell asleep. A movie is being shown 50 years after anyone is there to see it. But as she enters the theater, she notices a figure seated in one of the rows. It's a robotic head and torso wired to the projector. And after speaking with this being, she finds out that it is nothing more than a copy automation, a machine that has had the personality data of the man in the film room ported into its artificial brain. In his final breaths before death, this man essentially transferred his consciousness into a new body so that he could spend as much time as possible doing what he loves, watching films. And to me, there's something simultaneously bleak yet beautiful about this chapter, seeing two almost people, a tiny echo of humanity, just sitting and watching a movie about humanity to pass the time after the end of the world. The automation comments, even though those people and their world may be gone, they will not cease to exist as long as we are around to watch their movie. And I thought that was a lovely sentiment. But what continued to haunt me well after I finished this chapter was that automation of the film buff, the thought of what it must be like to wake up and find yourself running no longer on flesh and blood, but on circuitry and a motherboard. To no longer look with the eyes you were born with, but with cameras transmitting data to a copy of your consciousness. To know that your every thought was being simulated and furthermore, wonder if the emotions you were feeling when you watched these films were real. Reading this chapter was one of the remarkably few times I've consumed media that made me feel genuine existential dread. We joke about that phrase a lot, right? Oh man, you're turning 30 next month? Don't let the existential dread set in. And I get it, believe me, I do. But I mean sincere, shivering, staring off into space, existential dread. What I want to talk about today are games and other media that use this mind-uploading trope to, well, the only way that I can describe it is, they haunt me the most when I wake up from sleeping. They only bother me when I suddenly remember I'm alive, which I recognize sounds insane, but I hope I can paint a picture of what I mean for you by the time this video is done. And by the way, you don't need to worry about me. This doesn't happen every time I wake up, and even when it does, I still sleep fine at night. But yeah, these are the stories that give me actual existential dread because they are about existing and how exactly we define that. If you liked these videos, you're gonna like this one. There will be spoilers for each story, but most of them are a few years old and I'll dance around specifics as best I can. Timestamps will be on screen as well if you'd like to skip anything, so don't sweat that. Just take a deep seat, find a blanket and a hoodie and maybe your dog, and let's talk about waking up. Soma is a game that is based on a lie. But I won't tell you exactly what that lie is just yet. What I will tell you is that the year is 2015 and Simon Jarrett is not having a very good Saturday. He's been having headaches from brain damage sustained in a car wreck. To get some help with this and to assist a friend with their thesis, Simon has agreed to have his brain scanned, a harmless procedure. 
However, once the scan is finished, he wakes up in a drastically different location, Pathos 2, a mining facility that after a world-ending comet hits the Earth sometime after the 2060s, was then converted into a launch facility capable of sending satellites and other crafts into space. The year is now 2104. Humanity is on the brink of extinction, and upon slowly learning all of this and that his consciousness was transferred from his body in 2015 into this artificial body almost 100 years later, is obviously a lot to process. This premise works very well in Soma because, after all, it is a horror game. There is a looming sense of despair that hangs over every corner you turn. You're playing as a consciousness, not a person. Simon's life, his family, his friends, his career, his body, everything he has ever known or ever been is dust in the wind. He is just data drawn from someone that once lived 90 years ago. Not only is the Simon he once was gone, but any hope of a future is also gone now that the world is in ruin. However, the knowledge that consciousness can be transferred gives him a glimmer of hope when he meets Dr. Catherine Chun, who tells him about something called the Ark. You see, Catherine is like Simon. She no longer has a physical body. She has been uploaded into a mechanical one, much like a lot of the faculty here. And Catherine's job has been to develop a place for all of their minds to go, a virtual world where they can all live in harmony for the rest of eternity, an artificial heaven that they can ascend to and be at peace. This arc exists in a server that you will spend the game trying to find so that you can transfer Simon and Catherine's minds into and launch into space. Which if you finish the game, predictably, you successfully do. Simon wakes up on the Ark. It is warm and magnificent. Even if he is no longer technically human, this is still okay, right? This is real enough, right? This is better than death, right? Signalis is a survival horror game that takes place in a rundown facility called the S-23 Serpinski. Elster is a replica unit, an artificial human searching for the girl in this photo. And throughout your time with the game, Elster will begin to have visions and memories that seem out of place. You'll also begin to find files about replica units like Elster. Elster herself is an Elster unit built for combat. Other units like Yules are built for office work. But it slowly becomes clear that these replicas are not technically built as much as they are copied. There are documents left of the humans who are in charge of replicas explaining how to handle their behavior that stems from their quote unquote original neural patterns. The implication being that there was someone there before. These documents describe the personalities these units are likely to have, as well as fetish objects that may be given to them to stabilize their persona. Storches, for example, are described as unstable, needing patience and supervision, allow them to shower or bathe as a way to stabilize their persona. Make sure Euler units have access to music and a mirror. Their original neural pattern was a ballet dancer. But be sure not to play music or movies for your Elster unit. Their original neural pattern was that of a war veteran. Do not speak to them too much. One replica writes in his journal about a dream from his human life, and you realize that the Elster unit you are playing is, is having the visions she is having because her mind is corrupted by memories from her previous life, from the person that was used as a foundation for her consciousness. It's not unlike the sleeper you take the role of in Citizen Sleeper, a tabletop inspired narrative RPG that I can't recommend enough. The sleeper, like Elster, is a copy of a real person. They have memories from their previous life, but those memories are incomplete. They struggle to explain how foreign it feels to suddenly feel whole for a moment when a memory returns to them, only for it to then slip away just as quickly as if you've just forgotten something important and, and can't seem to bring it back. As if you've awoken from a dream, left only with the emotion of what was happening, but none of the details. 
the writing used to describe the sleeper's conflict between building new memories only for the old ones to then return and confuse them is stirring, and there's no shortage of this kind of language in Signalis, typically seen in one of Elster's nightmarish memories. It calls me in a sea of flesh. We will become one, but I can never go back to being me. Another makes a reference to a dream about dreaming. This video is serendipitously sponsored by the Manta Sleep Mask. And having used it several times now, I can guarantee that it does not transfer your consciousness into an apocalyptic future. It will, however, help you get a delightful, deeply restful sleep. Especially if you're traveling on a plane or in the backseat for a road trip. Maybe you're at a convention or an event and you're sharing a hotel room with your aggressively snoring friends. Or there is a light outside your window that is on a motion sensor that just kind of keeps sensing things. With fully adjustable 100% blackout C-shaped eye cups, all light is completely drowned out, even if you are a side sleeper like me. These bad boys are surprisingly breathable, machine washable, and come in several variations to fit your sleep style. The Manta Sleep Pro is my favorite, but maybe you sleep hot, the Manta Cool Mask might be for you. Sleep with music? The Manta Sleep Sound has adjustable razor-thin Bluetooth headphones to lull you away. Personally, I find the most use out of Manta Sleep Mask during the afternoons when I need to recharge after a long shift of my day job. I write my scripts for these videos in the evenings, so after turning myself off and back on again with a little 10 minute doze, I'm suddenly able to focus on writing and think clearly. So if you like sleep like I like sleep, be sure to visit the link in the description and use the code DTG for 10% off your order. Thanks again to Manta for sponsoring, now back to the show. Gwen Co. wakes up from a procedure and immediately notices that something, in fact nothing, is quite right. When she returns home, little things like the entryway to her apartment building feel simultaneously familiar and foreign, like she belongs here but is also unwelcome. She feels affection for her daughter Jules, despite also having sworn that they have never met. She is vexed by the music that Jules plays during her homework and asks her to turn it off, despite it being a song that Gwen has always liked. There is a tension between Gwen and her daughter, and eventually it comes to blows when Jules asks, Where's my mother? Get back to work. You're not her. What you don't know is that this is one of the later scenes in the movie, but you might have guessed that the reason for Jules feeling this way is because this woman is not fully Gwen. This woman is actually Gwen, and she's the one we spend time getting to know for the first half of the film. You see, in this terrible dystopian future, employment is hard to come by, especially for women past a certain age. And despite how brilliant Gwen Co. is, corporate heads feel she is a little long in the tooth to be the face of the company anymore, so she is being let go. As a single mom without money, she cannot pay for Jules to go to a good school, and she cannot guarantee a future for either of them. The job search is a continual dead end, and tuition is coming due. Out of options, she turns to the medical product she has been promoting at work. She agrees to be the first real test subject. Gwen will have her consciousness transferred into a younger, more marketable body, one that can remain in her position at work, guaranteeing Jules a future. She is obviously reluctant and pursues every other course of action, but ultimately, she goes through with it. Her body breathes its last breath, and her new body awakens to fill the role her old one no longer could. The movie Advantageous is an uncomfortable watch, but it kind of results in a happy ending. Jules has a future, Gwen rekindles her friendship with her family on the other side of this, and her daughter even begins to learn to love this new version of Gwen. And as we go to credits, it seems that all is okay. They did it. Except this ending is built on a lie, because in this scene, Jules was telling the indisputable truth when she says, You're not her. 
I'm going to show you the lie that Soma is built on, and to do that, I have to show you the ending again, unedited this time. on the Ark. I saw it. It finished loading just before it launched. Yeah, I saw. Then why are we still here? Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. Both- there is an assumption that people usually make when they consume stories with this mind uploading trope. It's an assumption that I made the first time I played Soma and an assumption that we all sort of make when we are in the middle of a sweet dream. And that assumption is that the other us, the us in the dream, in the arc, or in the new body, is us. That our consciousness moves into this new reality when in fact another reality was created, but we're still here. We believe that since Simon is just data now, that he can be transferred anywhere. We presume that the man in the theater has escaped death. He's just trapped in a seat now. We can accept that Gwen has moved into a new body. She's just recovering from such an intense procedure. But as we find out later in Advantageous, the new Gwen does not have the original Gwen transferred over. Gwen is not piloting this new body. Her memories and emotions have just been ported onto someone else's brain, not unlike Elster. This woman's memories are not her own. Jewel's mother really is gone. She perished when her synapses were all fried in the replication process. The man in the theater is dead. He merely left a copy of himself to continue enjoying what he once loved. He did not wake up in an artificial body. An artificial body woke up thinking it was him. And the same can be said for Simon. He is nothing more than a reproduction, a snapshot, feeling every bit of desperation that the original would be feeling upon this realization at the end of the game. We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us! The ending of Soma was a mindfuck by every definition. It made me angry, it made me cold, it made me lonely. Why do I care about some other me out there? It's not really me if I'm not the one being that me. I sympathize with Simon's rage, and that final scene has stayed with me to this day because it vocalized a terrifying sensation that until viewing, I've never been able to articulate. That feeling of waking up from a dream that felt so intensely real, only to all at once remember upon waking that you can't stay. You can't take anything back with you, no matter what or who it may be. The sensation of being ripped from one consciousness into another after being so sure that you were the one standing on the beach and not the one with work in an hour. The feeling that you didn't make it on the ark and being confronted with the reality that despite being teased with the promise of immortality, the promise of a sweet dream, reality is inescapable. There's a comment I read on a Reddit post a few years back that really captures this as well. Whether this person is telling the truth or not, who knows, but the story itself is chilling. A man is knocked unconscious after being physically attacked, and while he is laying there on the pavement, he lives an entire life. In this alternate world, he finds love, gets married, has children. And he describes this world with intimate details, how long it took to get his partner to agree to marry him, how he would go into his children's room every morning before work for years to dote on them. By his account, this life was every bit as real to him as the one you woke up to this morning. However, one day he notices that something is desperately wrong about the lamp on the table next to his couch. He stares at it 
confused, and the confusion doesn't leave. It's, it's, it's maddening how off this lamp looks, so he stares and stares night after night until his family begins to be concerned for him, until one day, the realization hits him. The lamp is not real, nor is this house, or his wife, or his children, and then he awakens, bloodied and bruised on the sidewalk, somehow simultaneously ages and yet moments later. It is a brutally sad read, but it almost perfectly illustrates what it is about all these stories that haunts me to the core. Dreams replicate reality, and even if a few moments after you wake up, reality settles back into your bones and it just becomes any other day, for a split second, for an unshakable instant as your eyes open, it's tough to tell which is the dream and which is reality. Was what I just saw a dream? Am I dreaming now? Did I know it was a dream? How would I know if this is a dream, or is this a dream about dreaming? And I realize that this is a lot. There's a reason it's taken me over a year to finally put pen to paper on this script, but I think it's because I didn't want to leave you here in the, uh, the, in the final scene of Inception wondering if the video you're even watching is real. I know I said at the beginning that this feeling overwhelms me some mornings when I wake up, and that's true, but it's only gotten better with time, and I think that's because the more I've marinated on these stories and the more I've consumed like them, there's something comforting that I was missing. A forest that I couldn't see for the trees. And to illustrate that, we need to revisit Signalis. Near the end of Elster's journey, we find her very close to reuniting with the girl in the picture, who I understood to be the lover of the woman that Elster is a copy of. Elster is looking for the woman from her implanted memories, from her life before she was a replica. And as she wanders this final empty stretch before her destination, there are no signs of life whatsoever. No more enemies, no other replicas, until she walks past several other Elster units, all in the same place she has been headed this entire time. And I won't tell you what happens next. I won't tell you if this Elster unit was successful, but I will tell you that what I find so grand about this story is that although it takes place perhaps several hundred years after the girl in the photo is gone, several hundred years after the woman that was used as a neural base for Elster is gone, the copy of her consciousness, this physical manifestation of her dreams, is still searching for her lost partner. The memories have guided her back to this place each and every time. No matter how many previous Elster units fail, a new one awakens with these same memories booted up, determined to find that which she has lost. Each Elster's actions is like the song of a dead musician ringing throughout an abandoned building, a movie showing in an abandoned theater. The recording of this person's love is continuing to play well after that person is gone. Except the recording isn't musical notes or well-acted scenes, it's a drive for this copy to forever search for what can never be found. A character in Citizen Sleeper describes the emulation of the sleeper as the people that made them splitting a shadow from its caster. And that's what I see when I look at Elster's journey the shadow of a person's love being cast hundreds of years into the future, long after the one who originally cast it is gone. Now there is more to the story here, and there is a dispute among the Signalis community about who exactly this girl really is, but I'm respecting spoilers as best I can. Go play the game, it's worth it. And then go to bait in the subreddit because they still can't figure out what in the Kingdom Hearts is going on with some of the details here. But this is my interpretation, and in a way, it recontextualized the ending of Soma for me. It became less about the broken promise of cheating death and more about the question, would you be happy knowing that another you will wake up, even if you aren't there to see it? Does it bother you that you won't get to see what people say at your funeral? Would you feel better about death if some piece of you is left behind to continue in your stead even if you won't be there to observe it. 
And after one particular story that isn't Signalis, the ending of Soma became even less provocative and somehow peaceful. And that story is Goodbye, Airy. This is a short one-shot manga that's written by the mind behind Chainsaw Man. It is around 200 pages, and it will only take about an hour to read, which I highly recommend. To me, it is a masterpiece, but unfortunately, I do have to spoil quite a bit of it. Though you should know, like Signalis, it is very open to interpretation of what exactly in this story is real and what isn't. So what I'll be spoiling is my take on it, what I think happened here. And I'll do it in such a way that if you've never read it and don't intend to go read it, you'll still fully understand what's happening. So, with that said, Yuda has been given a task by his dying mother. She wants him to record videos of her leading up to her death so that Yuda and his father have something to remember her by. The clips he records of her are tender, the woman that fills the frame is kind, loving, everything that embodies a wonderful mother. The few clips of his father are heart-wrenching as you see a man truly doing his best to keep himself together for his family's sake. His wife is dying, but he can't let that keep them from enjoying their last days together. Eventually, they must go to the hospital one last time. His mother doesn't have long, and it's time to record her final moments. But instead of going to see his mother, Yuta takes off running. His father calls for him, but he is not stopping because... We now cut to a high school gymnasium where the film is being shown, and the reactions from Yuta's classmates range from disgusted to confused. They mock him incessantly, laugh in his face. And after dealing with the reality of his mother's actual death and now the backlash of this creative endeavor, he decides to take his life. And on the roof of the hospital he plans to leap off of, just as he is about to put a foot up on the guardrail, someone stops him. A strange girl who recognizes that he is the one who made the Exploding Mother movie. She drags him away to an abandoned building. They sit down on a couch and without saying more than a few words, they watch movies for hours. It's only when the marathon has ended that she clarifies what exactly they've been doing. Her name is Ari. She wants him to watch more movies. She wants him to make another movie because she actually liked his film. And as time goes on, we see the two of them spend quite a bit of time together. Yuta is still recording a lot of his daily life because that's just kind of what he does at this point, and consequently, he films a lot of his time with Ari. They watch movies, she reads scripts he writes, they talk about the movies they watch until finally, Yuta has an idea. He is going to make a sequel to his original film that is essentially exactly what happened to him after he showed it. The protagonist is devastated after his first movie flops, and it all stems from his inability to film his mother's death. He goes to take his life and then meets a vampire who then makes him watch movies. Of course, this vampire is to be played by Ari. And then, Yuta adds a twist, something that has not happened. He decides that this vampire doesn't have long to live and that filming her death will give the protagonist closure since he was unable to film his mother's death. So the vampire asks the protagonist to film her every move until she is no more and then having done this, the protagonist can find closure. Ari likes the idea and then the filming begins. Or, or, or does, it, does it just continue? After you read this part, moving forward, you begin to lose touch with what exactly is reality and what is simply being acted out for this film. You get these gorgeous, surreal panels where Ari is being asked about what it's like to be a vampire, only to then end with her passing out into the ocean in a way that feels alarmingly unplanned. Yuta visits Ari in the hospital and she asks if he's recording. Ari then asks Yuta if he will film her final moments, just like his mother asked him, all according to the script, except Yuta panics at the proposition. He runs home in a cold sweat thinking about that question. Was, was that in the script? Is Ari really sick, or is this all just part of the act? But eventually, he returns to her, and they continue filming. Much like the movie about his mother, the girl in each scene is charming, funny, lovely, 
gentle. Yuta captures what anyone who is going to die soon would want captured, everything good and wonderful about them. We then find ourselves in a scene where the camera is just seated up looking out the window while the two of them speak. They talk about which clips will be used in the film. If they'd record another kissing scene, there are other tender remarks. And then Ari says, I wish I could have watched your movie, the finished product. And then they both uncomfortably sit in the truth, the reason she can't watch it. We cut back to the school gymnasium, all of the students in attendance captivated by Yuta's new film. There isn't a dry eye in the room. He did it. And if you were Tatsuki Fujimoto, you could have ended this story right here and it would have been a damn good read. Deeply moving from cover to cover, but for this to be truly remarkable, we need to address a question that Yuta is asked just after this film is shown to his classmates. Didn't Ari wear glasses? What about her dental retainer? You'd never know it from the movie, but Ari had a temper. She was self-absorbed. Wasn't she actually a pretty big bitch? Yuta admits to all of this. He even admits that they never dated. It was all for the film. And subconsciously, you realize that we never see Ari wear glasses at all in the entire manga. You can flip back to the first time we see her. No glasses, no retainer. It wasn't just here forward that was filmed. What was the truth? What was withheld? What was authentic? And what was shown to us intentionally? This is where rereading this and noticing all of the little things I didn't show you will hopelessly blow you away. This is a movie about a movie, a dream about a dream. The story continues. We find Yuta again years later after Ari is gone. He's recut the film over and over. He's poured over the 2,700 hours of footage he has from his time with her, but something just isn't adding up. And he's had enough of watching the people he loves die, so he decides to end it all in a place that meant a lot to him. He makes his way back to that abandoned building that they would always meet. What follows is difficult to explain. It is an ending that stays with you because it is intentionally not cut and dry. But what stuck with me the most is that this Aerie, claiming to be an actual vampire, supposedly did in fact die when Yuta was younger. She has no memory of her previous life, but she is watching the movie Yuta made for his classmates about her all those years ago. Apparently, the previous Ari that knew Yuta left instructions for how to live along with the copy of this film. Despite what the old Ari might have actually been like, because of how Yuta portrayed her in this movie, she is now the person that Yuta saw when he looked at her, not what she might have seen in herself. She didn't just become an objective snapshot of her previous self like Simon or Gwen or Elster. She became a subjective portrait of what the one who loved her believed her to be. The way he wanted her to be remembered. The only way we ever see her in the manga. And to me, that is absolutely beautiful. I'm reminded of the line earlier in the hospital when Ari says that she wishes she could have watched the finished product. If we take this ending literally, which maybe we shouldn't, but if we do, Ari is sort of facing the same fate as Simon. She cannot prevent her death. Another her may go on, but her consciousness and memories will not. She does not make it onto the arc. She doesn't get to see what the next Ari will wake up to be. It's just a dream that she won't get to remain in. After reading this, Soma's ending was no longer a cold, terrifying, hopeless revelation. It was a triumph. I sort of adopted Catherine's perspective instead of Simon's. They're out there, among the stars. We're here. None of our consciousnesses will last forever. What we experience from behind our eyes on a daily basis will come to an end. But as much as stories like these confront us with that uncomfortable truth, in their own way, they also paint a gorgeous picture of what we leave behind. Simon and Catherine are out there. Even if flesh and blood eventually failed, they are still dancing along the cosmos. 
the woman that was copied into Elster may be long gone, but the reverberations of her affection are still echoing throughout the night sky millions of miles away. Gwen may have perished and she will never see her daughter again, but her sacrifice was not in vain and a part of her will always go on being a mother to her daughter. Ari may never see what Yuda saw in her, but her friends would. We would. You may never see how much you mattered to someone, but it doesn't mean you didn't. What you did mattered. You matter. Humanity may have vanished, but it is not forgotten. Even though those people and their world may be gone, they will not cease to exist as long as we are around to watch their movie. Hey there, it's been a while. I took over a month off the channel, I recharged my batteries, played a lot of Street Fighter, and now here I am. And this video is what I came back with. Usually I have a pretty good idea of how a video will perform or be received, but I have no clue what the reception will be for this My Chemical Romance ass script. I've wanted to talk about Soma and Goodbye Airy so much for so long, but I had no clue how to write about this specific pit in my stomach I got when consuming each of them. But after playing Signalis, I felt like I had what I needed, so I hope you enjoyed this one. As always, I cannot thank my lovely Patreon supporters enough. If you'd like to support the show for a dollar a month, you too can get access to weekly bonus content, your name in the credits like you see here, and you might even get mentioned as a featured patron, just like these wonderful folks. Crescent Wolf 879 Ambush Deer Naru Cello Vandervecht Alex Melancon Nemise Smiles and David Hotright. Thank you so very much for watching. Like the video, share, subscribe. Let me know if I'm insane for talking about this down below. And until next time, please have yourself a damn good one. Because you see, folks, this is only part one of two videos concerning the backlog. There will be another full episode a year from now.